Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the AFT Show. It's episode number 14, and tonight's show is presented by VP Racing Fuels. I'm Scotty Dubler, the voice of American Flat Track and co-host of the podcast Off the Groove. Tonight, we got an extra special guest. It's the CEO of American Flat Track here to talk about 2020 and more. Please welcome Michael Locke. Michael, how are you doing, sir? I am well, Scotty. How are you? I am great. I'm, uh, we, you know, we're so close to racing action. Uh, I think my, I'm salivating a little bit. I'm ready for some racing. <laughs> uh, you, me, and everybody else. I think um, this has been a long, um, not self-imposed uh, shutdown, and uh, we've spent our time uh, feverishly planning for a new reality. And here we are. It's just about to happen. It is so close. Uh, what the race fans are going to get to see tonight is something that the race teams and riders and even some of our sponsors and promoters get to see the night before our first national. It's a sit down meeting. Uh, you usually stand up in front of everybody at Daytona. Uh, but tonight we're going to ask some questions and get some answers about the 2020 season. So thank you so much for your time. And I can't wait to hear some of these answers. I know the teams are, and you know, especially the fans are waiting to hear this information as well. So the first order of business is to talk about the Super Twins. It's brand new for 2020. So uh, what's in it for the fans as far as the Super Twins? Well, you know, um, S Super Twins is a new name. Um, but if you look underneath the title and the packaging of Super Twins, um, the, the racing will not really be a lot different than it was previously. It's pretty much all the same guys. Um, it's pretty much all the same bikes and teams. There's been a little bit of musical chairs, uh, as there is every season. But when fans sit down to watch the main event, they're going to watch full bore professional flat track racing like they did last year and the year before. Um, so... Uh, I think they should be as excited as they have been every other season. Um, uh, I would say that 2020 is continuing the rise of professionalism. Um, and everybody who's going to be in a Super Twins main event is a pro. Um, this has been a, a, a gradual creep in the sport over the last few years. But we're really now at the point where we can say hand on heart that um, American Flat Track and the Super Twins is the premier flat track racing anywhere in the world and can hold its head up now as a pro motorsport alongside anything. So I think that's the message we want to get across about Super Twins is um, don't be concerned about change, be excited about it. Uh, we've got factory backed teams all the way through that um, race paddock um, with dedicated riders who are fitter, leaner and better trained than they've ever been in their careers uh, and they all want to win they want to win the premier class um, so i think from a fan perspective there are some small detail changes um, uh, for example we're changing the way we're gridding for uh for the for the super twins main event so we will have 18 riders at each event um, but they are gridded four across now instead of six across and the four will take the space that the six used to. So obviously we have four rows of four and then a final row of two. And then if anyone's on the penalty line, then that would be a further row back. Um, so you're going to have a stretched start. And, and fans might ask themselves, why would you do that? Well, um, it's, it's partly about getting a, a better cadence of the start. Um, and not everybody funneling into that turn one all at the same time, all on top of each other. I mean, you know, Scotty, yeah. better than I, the number of races that we've had to pull a red flag on the first corner of the first lap. And it just, it just takes the atmosphere right down. Everybody has to regroup. So we're trying to address the cadence. Um, but also we've looked at this and, and studied it together with experienced pros and ex-pros and talked about um, space on the grid. Four across instead of six means more space width-wise as, well as, as well as the length-wise. Most incidents in flat track races happen in the first one and a half laps um, when obviously the field is most grouped. What we want to do is we want to give a little bit more space, get the race started, um, and have good racing all the way through to the checkered flag. So there are detail changes like that, for example, that fans will see that are different. 
Um, we're not changing the fact that the pole sitter can choose where on that row that they want to uh, they want to place. You know, we know that different tracks have different characteristics, and in, indeed, between two o'clock in the afternoon and nine o'clock in the evening, the track is different. So we don't want to change any of that. We want to still let them choose their place on the grid, but it will be spaced out differently now. And that is partly, as I mentioned, for cadence, partly for safety. And there are little tweaks all across um, the 2020 season that will fall into that category. That's just one example. I, I love that. And that, that makes qualifying even more important. If you're only going to have four guys on the oh. front row, you're going to have to do really good in your semifinal uh, to, to get yourself a good starting spot. Now, that, that's a really good point. Um, and you know, one of the um, uh, one of the things I've been looking at uh, down the last few years is the build up to the main event. Um, in in flat track racing, you know, you in AFT, you start early afternoon, and bikes are on track almost all day, but nothing really gets decided until the main event. The main event is. Um, it is the single most important thing. And when we look at TV audiences, the, 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 the audience peaks for the main events. Um, but we're there all day. So what I would like to see us do is explore how we make racing prior to the main event more interesting. How we make qualifying a kind of hold your breath and see who gets pole position kind of thing. And we're, we're exploring a number of options for the future, but you're absolutely right that when it comes to gridding like that for the main event, whether you finished um, uh, sixth fastest or third fastest, man, that's going to make a big difference. So uh, that's something to watch out for this season. Yeah, that's huge. Uh, so it's the AFT Super Twins presented by Vance and Hines. Um, what's in it to be a Super Twin rider? What's in it for the riders and for the teams? Oh, okay. Um, there's a short answer for that. Money. Um, uh, and, and I don't I don't mean that facetiously. What I mean is that if you've got, as we have this year, um, 15 season long permanent riders that you know whether you tune in for Volusia at the start of the season or uh, Texas halfway through the season or, or Daytona at the end of the season, you're going to see those stars week in, week out on the same bike riding for the same team. Um, which might sound like a statement of the obvious in motorsports, but you and I know that that's not been our history. Our history has been that uh, riders often didn't have a team. They were the team. Uh, and they would ride one brand of bike one week and one brand of bike another week. Um, and it was very confusing for any new fan, anyone who's casually coming to the sport because they've heard, wow, AFT's cool, and they tune in. We have to be able to deliver them a racing brand, a, a product that they can get hooked on straight away and then come back week after week. The reason we need to do that is that the um, reward that the riders and also the teams take out of the sport, uh, apart from winning championships, which of course three guys get to do a season and the other hundred don't win championships. So what do we do for the other hundred? We make them stars. How do we measure whether they're a star or not? How many people are watching them? And, and if you go back as little as five years ago, we could count less than 100,000 fans for a whole season for American Flat Track. And the way we would do that is we would count up all the people in the grandstand and all the people who were watching on Fans Choice. And five years ago, that would be 100,000 people a year for a pro sport, for a whole season. Wow. That's not a pro sport. That's a hobby. What we've done through the changes of, of, of uh, creating AFT and going to NBC and, and creating TV audiences and now moving fans' choice into the NBC sports app and creating track pass, all those things have been done for one reason, grow audience. We now have around 350,000 fans per race. Not a wow. season, per race. Wow. We have over 5 million fans a season. Now, why is that? Why is that useful to the rider? Or for a variety of reasons, because five million people watching a sport for a whole season, that's interesting to who? Caterpillar, Honda, Red Bull, Monster Energy, and the list goes on. That group of fans is now interesting. The sport's always been cool, but 
a, a sponsor can't throw money at a sport because the sport's cool. That You can't justify that. That makes you a fan, not a sponsor. To be a sponsor, you have to put in X hundred thousand dollars in order to get a return. This is the business side of any pro sport, which has been um, pretty much absent from flat track, maybe forever, um, certainly in recent years. So our job at the series is to create a huge fan base. And we're at five million now. I'd like it to be 10 million. At 10 million, I can knock on the door of Coca-Cola, hopefully. At 15 million, I can knock on the door of Ford. That's to get money into the sport. Some of it comes to the series to help us pay to put on this show, but it trickles down. It trickles down to the riders in the form of sponsorships. If you ask the top riders in Super Twins about their personal sponsor roster, it's transformed from where it was years ago. Um, and that can only get bigger. I want, I want the riders compensated like pro athletes. It's a short career. It's dangerous. You can get injured and miss half a season. They need to earn like pro athletes. So that's what's in it for them. If we take this um, embryonic uh, super twins concept we've got and we grow it year and year and year and we get more fans and we get more people following it, the riders will benefit. The teams benefit for completely different reasons. The teams have their own sponsors. Um, you see them on the bike. You see them on the haulers. You see them in the, in the pits. Um, they need eyeballs in the same way that we do. So um, it's a rather dull reason for creating, <laughs> uh, for, for creating uh, a new way of doing business, um, but it won't adversely affect the sport. The action will be as, excuse me, as good as it's ever been, and I think better. I think when you've got 18 professional athletes racing in a main event, I think you see high-quality sport. When you've got six professional athletes and a few have a go heroes, you may get you may get great sport, but you may get them being lapped halfway through the race, the guys at the back, and that's not pro sport. So we've been um, very focused on, on, on delivering this, and Super Twins is really a prototype for what we want the sport to look like in the future. And um, uh, and we would. Uh, in, uh, in normal circumstances, you and I would be now halfway through the season and we'd be saying, well, how have we done? <laughs> but we're still where we were uh, in, in, in March, um, still yet to, uh, uh, yet to debut. Um, but, uh, but this upcoming race is the debut of Super Twins, the first time in history that we've got this concept um, with an 18-rider um, main event, and, uh, you know, we, we've had a lot of discussion in our sport about um, uh, you being guaranteed a place in the main event. Is that sporting? Um, uh, and, and, and what happens to the little guy? We've had a lot of conversations around that. But, you know, the Super Twins is the top class. It is the class for the pros. It's the class for the guys who, sp who spend all winter raising money, uh, putting teams together, um, prepping for the season. They need to be in 18 main events, uh, like pro sports are. Um, and then we have uh, the classes underneath. We have the production twins class and the singles class, where there is still qualifying and there's an opportunity for young talent to make a name for themselves uh, and to get noticed and get snapped up in super twins. So I think the future on all this is really rosy. Um, but the proof of the pudding, where, where I come from, they say the proof of the pudding is in the eating. <laughs> so we've got to get back on track uh, and we've got to prove these concepts. One more question. Um, what's in it for the series to have the Super Twins team? What, why? What? What's? Yeah. You know, I mean, just what's in it for the series, I guess. Very simple. Um, uh, in, in my world, um, I, I, I have lots of windows I look through. One window is into our race community and the, uh, the relationships we have with manufacturers and with teams and with riders and with fans. That's one window I look through. There is another window I look through. It's called the pro sports world. I want a seat at the table with big pro sports when it comes to making decisions for the future. Uh, getting access to technology and talent and new ideas. I, we need to innovate our sport in order to keep up with the way the world is developing. Um, I'll give you a good example. Look at TV coverage of a big sport like NFL 
and go back on YouTube and look how that sport was broadcast 20 years ago and how it's broadcast now. It's astonishing now. The insight you get and the swooping cameras and the tricks and the graphics, it engages bigger and bigger audiences, it educates them, it entertains them. That's what a big multi-billion sport like NFL does. Now, I'm not suggesting we're NFL, but a lot of the people watching this um, podcast will watch Supercross or they'll watch um, MotoGP. Look at how those sports are being broadcast and how they're entertaining people now compared to years ago. Then look at us. Um, you know, we will have four fixed cameras. Um, we have an advantage of having an oval. We know where the riders are going to go. But I want to make that more engaging, more exciting. Um, I want to create more loyalty. So, so the window I'm looking through is being invited to have a seat at the table to sit next to IndyCar or uh, uh, MotoGP or Supercross and, and get to be uh, respected, get our sport respected as, as, uh, as something that you and I and, and your, your viewers on the podcast already know, but the rest of the world doesn't. So Super Twins is a calling card for me because I can go to a meeting in Connecticut at NBC and I can sit down with the head of broadcast for NBC Sports and in five minutes I can explain Super Twins and he nods and he says, man, that's awesome. That's why we have to do this, is that not everybody lives in our world. In fact, almost no one lives in our world. <laughs> We're the one percenters, right? Um, we have to have calling cards to the outside world in order to grow and protect our sport for the future. So Super Twins is a way of uh, explaining and demystifying our, our sport to people who are professionals or people who are casual fans who don't know who won the championship in 1987. Um, uh, they want to know what we're doing now. So that, that's really the driving force from a, from a business point of view. We're gonna take a quick break we come back for the CEO of American Flat Track, Michael Locke. At VP Racing Fuels, we are taking action to support the needs of America's businesses. We want to help America get back to work. So we're packaging and shipping thousands of gallons of hand sanitizer per day. As businesses reopen, protect your employees and give your customers the confidence they need to return to your establishment. Make sure your health and safety plan includes BP hand sanitizer. And welcome back to the AP Show. It is the CEO of American Flat Track, Michael Locke. A couple of different changes. One I really, really like is the letting the riders choose their font, the color of their numbers. Uh, <laughs> it gives them, it kind of, that way they can brand themselves. And I really like that. Um, is that part of AFT's marketing strategy or is that just to let the riders have, you know, a little bit of freedom? Scotty, it's really simple. These guys are the stars of the sport, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, you're a star of the sport as well, but <laughs> I'm not a star of the sport. The riders are the stars of the sport. The riders are uh, the individuals that fans um, love or hate and create emotion around and create loyalty to the sport. I want the riders to be able to express themselves. And people could say, well, they express themselves from the first flag to the last. Yes, they do. They do that every week. But people are curious about their personality. Who are they? What makes them tick? What makes them different and unique? We live in a world where everybody is special and everybody's unique now. Well, I want our guys who have been doing this since they were children uh, and dedicating their lives to it. I want them out there and I want them recognized and I want them loved. So um, them developing helmet designs and leather designs and, and, and the font and the colors, they're little, little things, but it's a hook for people to remember them. Uh, and again, I, I, you know, I keep coming back to the casual fan because we know we have a hardcore rump of people who live for this sport, but they alone can't pay the bills in a complex 21st century world. We need the casual people, the people who... Um, let me give you an example. You ever heard of a, a TV show called American Ninja Warriors? You heard of that? Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. You know it gets uh, nearly three times the TV audience that we do. That's crazy to me. Crazy. Is it because that sport is three times more interesting? No. 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 It's because it's easily relatable. 
uh, for people who are uh, what, looking on what's on TV tonight. Hey, yeah, that sounds cool. There's this guy who used to live under a flyover who was homeless and he's bounced back and he's cool now. And there's this guy who overcame cancer and this guy who's got 19 children. And it's, it's human interaction. If we can, without making a parody of ourselves, if we can demystify and, and get the fan closer to the, to the stars of our sport, that they feel they can reach through the TV screen and touch them. We will create loyalty. And when we do that, people will realize the sport we've got, the actual sport, is awesome. <laughs> but it's been awesome for 40 years, and a lot of people didn't notice. So we're trying to demystify open doors and, and little things like the number plate, the, the rider expressing themselves, their personality, through something like their number is a small thing, but why not? Um, it creates differentiation. And over the next few weeks, we're going to be uh, featuring on a daily basis um, the designs of the riders of Super Twins on social media so that people can get an idea of what is that plate and who is that guy. So it's it, we're in a sport, but sport these days cannot be divorced from entertainment. Um, and good sport need not be compromised by being entertaining. It just takes it to a wider audience. Well, I, I like it because, you know, like Nikki Hayden, everybody knows the 6'9 and it had a little yeah. star coming off the end. So little things like that. So, uh, you know, some people like them just because, you know, like a, a pro team just because of their jersey or their logo or their mm -hmm. brand. So um, have you seen any of the new changes and which one's your favorite so far? Well, I, I can't really have a favorite. I was uh, trying to throw you under the bus right there, you know. Look, look I, what I can tell you is that in the uh, five years um, I've been involved in this sport, I've gotten to know uh, a good number of, uh, of our riders, particularly our senior riders, um, who are sparky, interesting, unpredictable people with great stories. Um, I want America to know about those people. So... AFT has doing some new stuff in marketing. Can you elaborate on that? My word, yes. Um, we're reinventing ourselves in marketing all the time. Um, the, 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 the biggest thing we've done this year uh, in, uh, amongst a, a whole roster of things is we have um, struck an agreement with NBC, very big, powerful uh, broadcaster, to take our sport and put it in their grand strategy for the future, which is um, app-based real-time live streaming. Um, and a lot of your your, uh, your viewers for this podcast will have some idea about streaming. Some of them maybe use it all the time. You hear about people uh, calling themselves cable cutters. Um, cable TV is an institution, but the world is changing and people want more control, more choice. Um, so live streaming through your phone or through your TV or through your computer is the way forward. And NBC are a powerhouse in that world because they come from the traditional cable world and they're making the leap into the, to the app world. Um, the biggest thing we're doing in marketing is under the banner this year of TrackPass. TrackPass is the new um, brand that NBC are using to be able to bring AFT and some other motorsports um, to people in real time, wherever they are in the country, uh, on their terms. So you can sit on a plane and you can watch track pass. Um, and, and, and I do this all the time. So it's, it, it's a strategic move for us. Again, coming back to what I was saying earlier about broadening audience, growing audience, making AFT visible as a national pro sports league. That's the biggest thing we've done. Underneath that, and, and the success of that, will drive a lot of our other marketing. Um, we continually are improving the content at our events. Um, we want um, uh, AFT races to be a family-friendly event. What does family-friendly mean? It means that you can bring your family. It means that your nine-year-old kid who has a short attention span won't, after 45 minutes of being there, saying, Dad, when can we go home? Um, so we have to continually evolve the events and bring more content because I think we've got the flag to flag bit right. Now we need to build the layers of the onion so that um, food and beverage is more interesting. Live music is uh, there. Uh, 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 a fan vendor village is there with unpredictable 
elements, bike shows, all kinds of things. So those are very important um, pieces of the mix for us. Um, and, and fans who go to the events uh, will feel that they're getting something over and above what they can get if they just watch it on TV. So it's kind of important for us to, to balance the two. That's great. Um, we know motorcycle racing is an inherently dangerous sport. What has AFT done and you know what is something you're trying to do to take some of the risk out and make it safer for our riders? Look, this is a hot topic. Um, and arguably, uh, someone with your experience could say it's been a hot topic for a decade and decades and decades. Um, you get on two wheels uh, and you ride a motorcycle on dirt with no front brake and 100 horsepower between your legs. There are risks. We know that. Um, so what do we do as the series? Um, we've taken a view. And that view is that um, uh, the pursuance of safety falls into two buckets. A bucket of what we call preventative safety and a bucket of what we call reactive safety. And, and if I can just take a second to explain what I mean by those. Um, preventative safety uh, is all the things we do before we get to the event to minimize the chances of an incident. Um, practical examples of those. Um, okay, so um, the, the, the safety gear that riders wear. This is a perfect example of preventative safety. So we now have standards for all of the elements that riders wear, from the helmet uh, all the way through uh, the, uh, the, the leathers and the gloves and, and so on. Um, it's only, I, I want to say, only three or four years ago that we picked a helmet up off the track after a red flag incident. Someone's helmet had come off. And one of uh, my competition crew picked a helmet up and brought it back to staging. And we looked inside, and the helmet, it was an awry helmet, very good helmet. Um, but the, uh, the sticker inside said that it had been manufactured in 2004. Um, and, and this was on the head of one of our pro athletes at a national race. And people might say, well, if, if the helmet hadn't ever been dropped or crashed before, what's wrong with it being 15 years old? <sighs> well, the, the problem is they're not designed to last 15 years for street riders, let alone for people who are hurtling around the track. So that was an example early on uh, in my time getting involved in the sport where I realized we had a lot of work to do. So we have instituted standards for, for gear. Um, we haven't reinvented the wheel on those. We've taken good advice um, from safety organizations and from uh, manufacturers on what to do. The latest example is that for 2020 in the Super Twins class, we've mandated the use of what are called airbag equipped race suits. And for people who don't know what that is, it is a, it's a conventional um, uh, racing leather suit, um, but it has inside it um, tiny airbags and canisters of compressed gas um, that in the event of an incident where the rider is, or the bike is suddenly about to have an impact, that a microprocessor within that uh, leather suit realizes that something bad's gonna happen and it inflates the airbags, like the airbag in a, in a car, uh, like the set of airbags in a car. We've mandated the use of those for this year. Um, until the last couple of years, they were very expensive. They were four or five, six thousand dollars for a suit. You can now buy them off the rack in cycle gear uh, for under two thousand dollars, which means they're in the ballpark now with, with, with other good quality suits. So that's an example of preventative safety. Um, that if you equip the rider with the best possible gear, that in the event of an incident, they are less likely uh, to suffer injury. Then there is our licensing system. This is another pre-entative thing. Um, we raised the minimum age to race on uh, twins uh, from 16 to 18, not because there aren't some really talented 16-year-olds out there, but most 16-year-olds are not fully formed human beings yet, um, either physically or between the ears. So learn your trade in the pro game at 16 on uh, the singles, uh, demonstrate uh, your maturity, and then graduate to the twins. Again, it's a small thing, but it's preventative. We're, we have raised the requirement to have an AFT pro license. Um, 
uh, based on your previous history of number of races that you have um, uh, competed in. It, it struck me that uh, in the history of our sport, um, there is a, 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 a very great um, heritage of racers who are regional. So they will do two races in Illinois because they live in Illinois and they won't do the other 16 races a year. On the surface, it doesn't sound like a bad idea, except the other guys are doing 18 races a year. They race against each other every week. They know each other inside out and they are finely tuned athletes. You throw in some talented amateur from some small town in there and trouble happens. So we are progressively raising the uh, uh, number of races you compete in as a requirement for the next, um, uh, uh, the next season. So these are preventative. The biggest single preventative measure though, you and I both know what that is. It's the track. A good consistent track is the single biggest variable for preventing incidents. We can't, we can't ultimately make a, a, a determination or have any control over a decision a rider makes in a split second, right? That's up to them. But the track surface they're on, its predictability, its grip, uh, how it holds together during the day are vitally important. And it is the number one challenge in flat track racing. I think always has been. Um, you have rain the week before and the track's heavy. Um, you put calcium chloride down or you don't. Um, there's direct sunlight and it dries out and gets dusty and so on and so on and so on. There's no magic answer on this. Um, we've looked, uh, we didn't find a magic answer. So what we've done um, this year um, is we really stepped it up and we've had a long off season <laughs> to be able to prep for this. And I've asked uh, Steve Moorhead, who is our most experienced uh, competition official uh, and, and someone who raced on the pro circuit himself for, well, I won't say how long, but quite a long time. <laughs> um, uh, a national plate holder, has won races, has raced all across the country and has now worked for us at AMA Pro Racing for a while. I've asked Steve to spearhead the project of track preparation and maintenance um, and to document everything we do and to make sure that in advance we have all the right equipment, not that on the week we, do, we go down to the local plant hire place and see what they've got, that we plan ahead for, um, uh, for track preparation and maintenance equipment, for any chemicals we use, uh, to boost the size of his crew that they go in earlier, all with an aim of doing one thing, deliver the best track possible. So in the preventative side, those are just some of the examples, but some of the important ones. On the reactive side, um, we're doing something very new this year, um, long overdue, I would say, um, uh, but linked to what I started this podcast talking about, which was revenue. Revenue can't solve every problem, but it certainly makes it a lot easier. Um, what we're able to do this year, because we've grown the sport, is we are able to finance and maintain what we're calling a rapid response medical unit. Um, what does this mean for the fan? It means doctors. We're actually going to have, I think for the first time in the history of flat track, at every round this year, doctors. Motorsports experienced doctors who will be on site, they will be equipped with a rapid response unit so that if something happens on the track, they can be there in a heartbeat. And you know and I know, because we've been at the tracks, Time matters. <laughs> Time matters. If you have an incident happen on track, the quicker you can get a highly qualified medical professional there, the quicker the right decision can be made um, for the benefit of the athlete. So this is big news as far as I'm concerned uh, for AFT this year is that we are launching a um, highly qualified um, rapid response medical unit. I'm very happy to be able to do it. We would have done it earlier if we could have paid for it. Um, but we found a way this year, and I think that the sport never looks back from this point. I think that's huge, and they're going to be ready to go in a Honda Talon so they can jet out to the incident as soon as possible. I think that's awesome. Uh, a few things that we didn't touch on as far as bike safety, mandatory padding on the crossbars, that's new. Uh, mandatory brake lever guards on their machines, that is also new. You, you did mention the mandatory airbag. That's for the Super Twins class. 
Uh, it's mandatory. It is highly recommended for the other two classes, the production twins and the AT singles class. Um, recommended a, a, a helmet removal system. That's something new. A lot of the new helmets and the, the good helmets have that. There are little tabs you can pull to properly take that helmet off yeah. without disturbing anything. So a, a few things we didn't touch on right there. Um, there's, the medical there's a whole long list Correct. of detail points of things that we have um, studied. We have listened to experts. We have tried to work out how we implement. Um, you know, there's a, there's a balance in this sport between um, necessary progress, things we have to do because they're obvious to make our sport better and safer versus why are you changing our sport? And, and these, these two uh, points of view come into conflict sometimes. We have um, what could be described as a conservative sport in some ways, that people are a little suspicious of change. They think that change means that something's being taken away from them. But in fact, the change that we're pursuing is to improve the sport and to protect its long-term future. So yes, there is a bullet point list of things that we're doing, um, the, the roost guards that we're going to use, um, so that uh, so that bikes are not throwing up the roost right in the face of the guy behind, and so on and so on. In fact, we just had a. I'll give you an insight. Um, we had a long meeting this week uh, here in the office to talk about sunset. Sunset. We we have a sport that starts during the day and ends during the night, so there is a transition period where. Uh, very often the sun can be in a position where going into turn one or turn three um, that the riders are struck with glare. The way that we deal with this currently is we get off track for an hour, but it's prime time. <laughs> that that right. sunset time is often between about 7.30 and 9 o'clock. This is when all the fans are in the grandstand, um, full house, prime time for streaming or on TV. So we're having a discussion now about how can we bend nature with technology? We can't make the sun go away. I and mean, we can stick it behind a cloud, but that's a higher authority than you or I that determines that. So we, we can't determine where the sun is, but what can we do to mitigate it? You know, this, this, is, this is where technology comes in. And I had a, a long discussion with um, a couple of guys who work in the helmet and the shield industry and said, you know what, as a road rider, I don't get off the road during sunset. If I ride one of my sport bikes, uh, you know, within the speed limit, um, and, and, the, and the sunset is, is coming, I don't get off the road. I use a dark shield. Okay. Well, it's not as simple as that in racing. It's not as simple as that. But is there a solution? Is there technology that we can pursue uh, polarized windshields or different kind of tear-offs in order that we can narrow that gap of downtime. These are the kind of things that really occupy our minds and speed up the show, make it more fun for the fans, uh, have the riders on track while they're in the zone, all of these things all the time. So there is an almost endless list. I mean, you and I could do three or four podcasts uh, just on uh, how we're tweaking some of our processes and technology in order to make the sport better. Absolutely. Um, timed races, something new for 2020. All main mm. events in all yeah. three classes will be timed. Uh, I can relate that to Supercross. It works very good in Supercross. It, re it works really well with the TV partners. So can you uh, tell us more about why we're doing timed main events? Mm. Um, yeah, there's the obvious thing. And you, re you reference Supercross. Um, but there's something specific to flat track, um, which has really bugged me since I've been involved in the sport, that if I go um, to, uh, let's say I go to a race at Weedsport, New York, beautiful facility, uh, we sell out there, we got passionate fans, uh, but it's just less than a three-eighths mile track. And it's a fast three-eighths mile. So if you have a race that is comprised of laps, the actual length of those main events will be much less than half the length of a race at, let's say, somewhere like Sacramento for the mile or Minnesota. Um, 
So the fans are all paying the same amount to go, <laughs> to go whether they go to a short track or a half mile or, or a mile. And yet they're getting much less racing on, on the shorter tracks if you do it by laps. This has really bugged me since I got involved in the sport. <laughs> so um, we, we've talked about it and talked about it. And we've looked at um, uh, sports like Supercross and many, many others that have timed uh, uh, races and felt that we would be doing um, the sport a favor and we would be doing the fans a favor if we could somehow um, uh, narrow that range. I'll give you an example. The, uh, the, the main event race for singles at Weedsport, I think, lasts four minutes, 50 seconds. Blink. Over like that. Yeah. Go and get a beer. Go and get a beer. Come back and see who's on the podium. There's something wrong with that. Um, so we, we're not going to fix this overnight um, because if you went from um, a four minute 50 race at, at Weedsport to one that's comparable to the singles on the mile, they'd end up doing like 50 laps or something. So it, it's not as simple as just the math. So what we've done for this year is we've moved to timed races. So, um, for example, in Super Twins, on a mile, uh, all the mile races will be 14 minutes, a countdown clock, 14 to zero, plus two laps on every mile. On every half mile, they will be 12 minutes, and on every short track, they will be 10 minutes. So we haven't completely solved the problem, but what we've done is we give – we give the fan a bigger bang for the buck. We give um, the broadcast team, who are very hardworking uh, and, and long-suffering, as you know, um, we give them more predictability about the race. Um, and we really create a crescendo uh, to, towards the end of a race. I think we, we pump the excitement. You know, they will, they will come in at the end of, uh, at the end of uh, 14 minutes uh, for the Super Twins, and they will get the two laps to go, and there will be two laps at the end of that timed race, um, which will be as exciting as hell. So that is another change we've made for this year. Uh, I don't think we're reinventing the wheel because, as you mentioned, Supercross uh, has really pioneered this and, and some other sports as well. But it's a new uh, feature for 2020 that I think the fans will find exciting once they get their head around it. Yeah, and for the teams, it's going to take a little bit of time to start figuring that out and you know, maybe for the rider to save their tire or – or go all out for the full full time. We'll have to wait and see. And it depends on what track we're at. And speaking Absolutely. of tire, Dunlop has the brand new DT4 that looks amazing. I cannot wait to see that in action myself. Scotty, I'm so excited about the tire. I know it's a kind of nerdy thing to be excited about a tire, but <laughs> um, but but again, you know, I I I've come from outside this sport. Uh, I've come from. Uh, street bikes and road racing and, and and so on. So I come into flat track and and bring maybe a little different view and different experience. And um, to say that I was surprised that the premier flat track racing anywhere in the world was using a 40-year-old tire would be understating how surprised I was. I would not use a 40-year-old tire on my car for the street at 65 miles an hour because the technology in tires has changed so much. And, and th there, was a, there was a prevalent um, um, argument in flat track that I ran into when I asked people about this. And they said, well, you know, the, the, the old tire's good because it keeps the speed down. And I thought, man, there, there's a, some perversity in that argument. Um, the tire is really the only thing that should be touching the ground. <laughs> it's the only contact the rider has um, uh, to what's going on underneath. I think you would want the best possible tire. It's not about making them go faster. If you look at lap times now versus lap times when Chris Carr was champion and lap times when um, uh, Scotty Parker was champion, they're not going a lot faster. It's not, it's not about that. It's about better feel, more predictability, more durability of the tire, and safety. And so... We have a long-term relationship with Dunlop, as, as you know. Um, and Dunlop have been big supporters of this sport. And they make the tire in the US, and that is the key. Because if the tire is developed in the US, if the R&D is done in the US, I can speak to the right guys, unlike 
maybe tire companies that bring them in from Asia or Europe, where it's a little bit more difficult. So we leveraged that um, uh, ability. And uh, Mike Buckley, who's the who's the head of um, the motorcycle division at, at Dunlop, him and his team enthusiastically threw themselves into this. And we went through a few iterations of the tire in testing and R&D before they settled on the design that we're going live with, the DT4 tire. And we tested that finished tire with a number of, uh, a number of the riders in our pro paddock, uh, the top riders. And every single one of them said, could I take a pair of these home with me? Um, and then you know you're onto a winner. So I am so looking forward to them all racing on this new, vastly improved modern tire. I think it's a, a good thing, a massively good thing for the sport. Yeah, I, I, I do too. I'm right there with you. You know, you can't run on old technology forever. And I, I love the advan the advancement that Dunlop has made. So uh, we we want to say thank you so much for your time and and telling us what's going on and the vision and and all the rules and stuff that we briefly touched on. I know we could go on for hours. Um, mm. One more time, we talked about the the, you know, the track you know the track pass on NBC Sports Gold. Um, less than a dollar per 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 round. I mean, you can't go wrong. You got to do it. So. I'm man, I just I can't reiterate enough. If you can't go to the races, get on NBC Sports Gold and get that track pass. And uh man, it's it's awesome. Scotty, for the, the price of the subscription for track pass for the whole of the 2020 season, I think I spent more than that this morning buying myself a cappuccino and a croissant at Starbucks. <laughs> Probably so. Well, we certainly appreciate it. Cannot wait to see you down here in Florida real soon. I guess next week as it as it be. And uh <laughs> It's, it's almost here. Special thanks again to VP Racing Fuel. They are providing hand sanitizer for all the teams, all of the people at the races, and they are today's presenting sponsor for today's podcast. Michael, again, thank you so much for coming on. My pleasure. See you very soon. Thanks a lot, race fans. This has been the AFT Show with Michael Locke. Thanks to VP Racing Fuels. At VP Racing Fuels, we are taking action to support the needs of America's businesses. We want to help America get back to work, so we're packaging and shipping thousands of gallons of hand sanitizer per day. As businesses reopen, protect your employees and give your customers the confidence they need to return to your establishment. Make sure your health and safety plan includes BP hand sanitizer. I love it.